I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. Uh, thanks for coming so early for the uh, Creating Shared Value, the Role of the Private Sector in Agricultural Development Conference. We really appreciate our friends at Nestle for helping sponsor this. Thanks for, for doing this, Molly, and thanks, Janet, for coming all the way from Switzerland to be with us. Um, I think some of the, uh, the conversations we're going to have today build on the work that we've been doing here at CSIS on the role of the private sector in development that uh, we've been doing uh, in partnership with, with Chevron. My friend Joanna Neseth is, is here and will be here shortly, but also builds on the work that she helped start here on food security as well. So I think there, it's a nice, this is a nice combination of a number of different things that we're working. It also builds on the work that we've done on youth in partnership with the International Youth Foundation and, and Bill Reese is here as well. So I, Bill, thanks for being here. So I think we're going to be talking about a number of very interesting pressing issues in development today. I think the common theme is looking at this through the lens of what is the contribution of the private sector and what is the contribution through a lens of what we're going to what is described as shared value, which many of you have heard of and you're going to hear a lot more about today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the floor to my friend uh, Bill Garvelink, who used to be U.S. Ambassador to the Democratic Republic of Congo. He's a senior advisor here at CSIS and also is a good friend and really knows these issues very, very well. So, Bill, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Okay. Well, I'll stand up there. All right. Well, good morning again. Uh, thanks for showing up so early on a cold morning. I'm surprised you all have done this. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think we're going to have a very interesting uh, discussion during the course of the day. And I think the, the keynote panel, the opening panel, is going to talk more broadly uh, about uh, the private sector and agriculture. And as time goes on, the panels will be, get, be getting more, more specific. Uh, and as Dan said, we're going to talk a lot about shared value. And uh, it's my sense that uh, shared value is talked about a lot now. It's not really a new term. I think it's a refinement of uh, corporate social responsibility, which existed some some years ago and came into to importance. I was looking. It's um, Michael Levitt's not here, is he? One of the early one of the early pioneers of uh, corporate social responsibility, and of course, Nestle has a long history of of uh, focusing on shared responsibility and a, and a particular focus on on uh, smallholder agriculture. But um, what I would like to do is sort of just with that, uh, introduce the panel, and I'll introduce each person now, and we'll go in the order from Secretary Veneman to the Ambassador uh, for comments, and then I may have a question or two for them, and then we'll open it up uh, more generally uh, to everyone. I think you have the, the biographies of each person here. Secretary Veneman. Uh, was the executive director of UNICEF and before that secretary of agriculture and she was the secretary of food and agriculture in the state of California as well. And next to her is Secretary Glickman who is the executive director of the Aspen Institute, the congressional, um, I forget the exact title, okay. Close enough. And he was also Secretary of Agriculture before Secretary Veneman. I've got, this is complicated. And he was in Congress uh, representing the 4th District in Kansas for, I think, 18 years. And so it's had a long history in government. Uh, Ambassador Dehinden, I'm learning his very old name. He was telling me it's, it's an ancient Swiss name. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting history. Who was the uh, Swiss ambassador to the United States. And before that, he was head of the Swiss uh, Department of Development and Cooperation. So we have a panel with a lot of experience uh, as donors and in government and multilateral organizations dealing with food security and nutrition. And so with that, I will turn it over to Secretary Veneman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Oh, I got to turn this on, I guess, then you can hear me. Um, and thanks to uh, CSIS for um, hosting this, this meeting today on, on the important issues of, of food and agriculture and nutrition security. Um, I look around this room and so many of you are expert in these areas uh, of agriculture and rural development, and yet we see so much uh, of the work that's done in these areas that really doesn't have the kind of coordination it should have. So 
I want to just kind of put a little landscape on some of the issues we're dealing with and then talk a little bit about the private sector. Um, so we have, as most of you know, about over 800 million people in the world who suffer from chronic hunger today. Many are in rural areas, and yet there are 1.9 billion who are overweight, according to the latest WHO statistics, 600 million of whom are obese. Uh, an estimated 2.5 billion suffer from micronutrient deficiencies. Um, chronic diseases now account for more deaths than communicable diseases or hunger in the world. So for too long, there's also been a focus on calories to address hunger, and the conversation has to shift to nutrition. Some have estimated that food production will need to increase by 60 to 70 percent to feed a population of 9 billion by 2050. But this is based on the assumption, primarily, that people will continue to con consume more animal protein, which is arguably not environmentally sustainable or healthy. And at the same time, there is an estimated 30 to 40 percent of food that is wasted around the world. Water experts now believe we will fight, oh, excuse me. Um, on water, agriculture uses about 70 percent of the world's fresh water, um, yet nearly 800 million people do not have access to clean drinking water. And it's now believed that we'll fight more wars over water than oil. Droughts are impacting food production around the world from Africa to Australia to California and Asia, and that continues. Agriculture is contributing to climate change. It's impacted by climate change. But with proper management practices, agriculture can help address climate change with sustainable farming practices, which capture carbon, protect soil and water quality, and conserve water. The global supply of arable land is limited, and there are increasing concerns about soil quality a recent article indicated that 20 percent, nearly 20 percent of China's arable land is now contaminated. There's concern about land grabs, while so many smallholder farmers, especially women, have no land rights. Food price volatility impacts global security. In 2008, there was civil unrest in around 30 countries due to the rising food prices. So these are just a smattering of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, there are many, and there must, as I said before, be coordinated approaches to addressing them. The landscape really is changing dramatically, the way people are working together. Traditionally, it's been about government works over here, civil society here, the private sector does things over here. I do think the landscape's changing, and there is a key role for the private sector to play. I think social businesses have brought new thinking about how to use market-driven approaches um, to societal issues. And then you layer on that the fact that many co companies, as was uh, introduced um, initially, are involved, all, you know, are involved in creating shared value and tri triple bottom line and corporate <laughs> sustainability. There are many concepts, but it's about managing risks and opportunities for growth in, and developing solutions that respond to the future demands of customers, other stakeholders, and the needs of the planet. So as I said, the private sector has a key role, and I wanted to just talk about a few ways that the private sector can be involved. Uh, one, of course, that we talk about a lot in agriculture is ag extension. So the private sector has been quite involved in this. Educating farmers in good production practices and providing better seeds and rootstock increases both productivity and product quality. The company benefits then from a better and more consistent product quality, and the farmers benefit from higher income and the ability to then better feed and educate their families. Um, truly a shared value approach. Recognizing that women make up as many as 70% of the smallholder farmers in the developing world, 
companies are in implementing inclusive approaches for women throughout the value chain, and I think you'll hear more about that in the next panel. Um, there is also work with NGOs in working in extension. Uh, organizations like TechnoServe has been very willing as an NGO to, to partner with the private sector. Technology transfer is another huge area, whether it's improved seeds for drought tolerance, irrigation technology, technologies, there's social business, businesses such as DripTech, which was developed in the Silicon Valley and is now working in India primarily delivering drip irrigation in a box to smallholder farmers. Cell phones now provide all kinds of information to farmers from real-time uh, information on markets to banking information to weather. I uh, became aware a few years ago of an interesting uh, NGO private sector partnership when Ericsson teamed up with the Global Humanitarian Forum to put weather monitoring equipment on cell towers, giving African farmers access to weather data that they had not previously had. So this was a good example of an NGO private sector partnership. The private sector has also developed technologies for precision agriculture, many of which can be adapted for developing country farmers including a lot of work that's now going on on drones that are being developed for livestock monitoring and crop monitoring. The private sector is also providing nutrition solutions from food fortification to product reformulation to reduce salt, sugar, uh, uh, and fat content. There's considerable focus, as many of you know, on the importance of nutrition in that first thousand days, which is essential an essential time for brain development. And many companies are investing in nutrition education. Social businesses such as Beyond Meat are researching plant-based protein meat alternatives to address both health and environmental concerns. And there are even some young social businesses that are developing technology um, to cost-effectively produce insects, which are an important source of protein to as many as two billion people in the world. You did get insects in there. I did. I told you I was thinking about it. You got some outside. Yeah. It's true, two billion people. Um, the supply chain, the private sector has a key role to play in developing supply chains, um, processing plant development and construction, how the private sector can look at how their saving water, as Nestle did, just did with a zero water plant in Mexico, or in constructing a plant, providing clean water for the community in which the plant is located. Food waste, the private sector can play a key role in, in storage solution, solutions to prevent uh, spoilage and, and insect infestation. Uh, insects again. <laughs> and <clears throat> there's increasing private sector solutions uh, for risk management tools like crop insurance products are becoming available through the private sector for smallholder farmers. So these issues of nutrition, agriculture, water, climate, energy, and poverty alleviation, they're complex, but they're all interrelated, and we must look at them as interrelated issues. We can't any longer afford to have piecemeal approaches. The solutions must be holistic, they must involve government, civil society, and especially the private sector. And creating shared values really does require shared approaches. <coughs> so thank you. Thank you. Secretary. Thank you. Uh, thanks to you and Dan Rundy and CSIS for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, i seen my lot of talent in this room. <coughs> my friend Bob Thompson out there and knows more than I think the whole room put together. But although I won't demean anybody else here. but uh, And then Lisa Moon is here, and she runs the Chicago Council on Global Affairs program on food security. And just a little promo, we're doing our major symposium in April on the issues of nutrition and health. And I encourage you to uh, participate in that if you can. And uh, But in any event, let me build on what Ann said and a couple of things. Uh, these markets in the developing world can become some of the most prosperous <coughs> in, in, in the future with population and demographics changes. Um, 
the U.S. Ex agriculture exports to Africa have increased about 200 percent in the last 10 years, which actually isn't very much when you think about it. But the African food market is expected to reach a value of $1 trillion by 2030. So these are big markets. And North Asia is now a bigger food market for U.S. farmers and businesses than North America. Markets in Asia will continue to grow. So when businesses look at Africa and Asia, they are beginning to see profitable markets and not just poverty alleviation. So I think that is good news. And uh, companies are doing some great things in this area. Nestle has been mentioned. DuPont has been very active in the food security index. A, a lot of other companies uh, in terms of hel helping entrepreneurial efforts. But, but I want to talk a little bit about the disincentives or the issues that we have to work on to try to build both shared value as well as business opportunities. And these are not anything secret. Most of you know all these things, but it can't happen without effective progress in the area of, one, governance and corruption uh, and contract adherence. So uh, people are not going to invest if they think their assets are going to be taken away from them or expropriated or devalued or if the contracts aren't going to be worth anything. And that's a problem that's worse in some countries than the others. Governments try their best to help. Em our embassies are doing their best. The private sector has a big role in this issue of, of encouraging um, uh, uh, more effective leadership training for prospective government officials, leadership training for people in food and agriculture efforts, and that's certainly one disincentive. The second disincentive is infrastructure, and that, I don't just mean roads, I mean roads. I usually, infrastructure, I usually say roads and refrigeration. Um, but, but how you traverse the marketplace to get goods from one point to another, and then how you store them and keep them in good shape so they don't spoil. Uh, the uh, Chicago Council just did a, a blog this a uh, couple days ago which talked about the massive amount of food that's wasted in both the developed and the developing world. But this issue of storage and refrigeration is a big part of it, and how we can develop technologies, particularly small-scale technologies, to help people uh, protect the uh, value of their food, um, either on farm or in community. The third thing is finance. Okay, so how you gonna how you gonna uh, invest, and and how are you gonna get investment at the local level as well as taking your companies and and from a top-down perspective, getting. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the appropriate amount of um, mon money into these circles to build systems, even at the small scale level. And the fourth is the human capacity efforts. Uh, Anne talked about extension. Uh, the U.S. government historically was much more active in land grant college relationships with um, uh, both universities in, in the developing world. Um, as, as well as uh, bilateral fellowships, Cochrane Fellowship in South Africa. These, these items have diminished rather significantly in the last 10, 15, 20, 30 years. So if you don't have the human capacity being developed, it's not just the U.S. It's, a lot of this is developed uh, on its own. Brazil now is probably, Brazil and China are the two countries that are actively more involved in developing human capacity. But when you develop human capacity, you develop relationships. And, and, um, uh, and so I, I, I think that's an area that gets under attention and trying to figure out how the private sector can engage in this area with uh, uh, educational institutions around the world to, uh, to further develop that. There are some positive trends, and mentioned the whole issue of tech, communications technologies, uh, social media, cell phones, modern smartphones, and that's an antidote to some of what we're talking about here because that empowers people to do a lot of things, get pricing information, get technical information much more quickly, and, uh, and the private sector has been very, very active in that as well. I want to talk about one other issue which I think is really important, and that's the whole issue is of trade. It's very hard for agri-food businesses to be profitable in Africa and Asia right now because it's difficult to move products and food within and between countries. So countries have also undeveloped and inconsistent food standards and regulatory frameworks, which further complicates doing business. So uh, I've mentioned the Chicago Council uh, is, is in their global food security project, which I co-chair with the former Congressman Doug B. Ryder of, of Nebraska. So the Council today released a paper on how the U.S. can partner with African countries to overcome some of these trade and regulatory issues. And I want to talk just a, for a second about what we concluded. 
First, we reached the same conclusion that many people in this room have already had, that businesses can advance food security and make profits by investing in agriculture and food sector overseas. You can do both. But business cannot be as active as it wants to be in Africa because of trade and regulatory barriers. The U.S. trade relationship with Africa is almost entirely governed by the African Growth and Opportunity Act, or AGOA. AGOA focuses on bi bilateral trade but does nothing to improve trade between African countries or solve standards and regulatory issues. It also barely benefits food and agriculture. In 2012, of the $52 billion in food and agriculture products that Africa exported, less than 1 percent were destined for the United States. And in that same year, only 5 percent of trade facilitated by AGOA was related to food and agriculture. So we've got a real structural problem here in building a trade system that allows you to build a, 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 a basically a business uh, profile that allows you to grow, build, build businesses, employ people, small scale, medium scale, and large scale. So we've recognized, we recommended a new framework for U.S.-Africa trade relations that would have more benefits for businesses and food security. The pro proposed framework would prioritize getting better seed and modern technologies to smallholder farmers. We suggest a focus on regional trade, which would allow food to be moved more cheaply and efficiently across African borders. And we lay out methods for improving the legal environment in Africa for reducing vulnerability to ad hoc government interventions that restrict African countries' abilities to import affordable food. Um, so if you read this paper, you know, there's a lot talking about a new U.S.-Africa food dialogue, advancing regional uh, integration of food, dealing with technical regulations and standards. But in addition to that, the U.S. government doesn't devote very much resources with respect to trade when it comes to Africa. USTR is notoriously understaffed in this area. Through trade promotion authority legislation, can Congress can authorize more staffing in USTR for this purpose. Congress should also ask the newly created <coughs> Undersecretary of Trade at USDA, which has not really been implemented yet. It's in the statute to take the lead on interagency coordination of food and agriculture trade issues as it affects to agriculture. So, you know, right now the, the WTO is, is almost paralyzed on a lot of these issues. And so the U.S. government must shift its focus towards trade, regulatory and, and standards issues. And that will allow the private sector to be, be better to able to pursue profits and advance security, food security in some of the world's poorest and most yet most <coughs> promising uh, regions at all. And the role of the private sector in this is really paramount. Thirty years ago, I don't think that the private sector was ever really consulted on any of these things. But now uh, companies, uh, if they want to um, add value uh, to their business plan, uh, have to be actively engaged with the U.S. government. Finally, let me just make a couple of quick comments. One is USAID, uh, USAID in my judgment, is remarkably uh, better than it was 20, 30, and 40 years ago in this area in terms of working with the private sector. Under uh, Administrator Shaw's leadership, I think there has kind of been a, a revolutionary attitude change on that relationship, and I hope his successor continues this forward. And finally, I want to just lay out a, a, a plea that there are a lot of best practices happening out there. Nest, Anne's mentioned Nestle, DuPont. There are a lot of companies, small, medium, large-scale companies doing great things. There's got to be a way to share those best practices in a way that others can kind of pick this up without reinventing the wheel, and we really have to make this a high priority. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I will speak from the perspective of someone who was head of the Swiss Development Corporation, uh, running programs, but also having been involved in uh, a lot of multilateral uh, discussions on the issue, and of course also as a person who is convinced that uh, public-private partnerships uh, are important and help to solve poverty. The year 2015 is, in my view, crucial uh, for sustainable <laughs> development. The Millennium Development Goals that have shaped many policies in development countries, but also uh, in the donor countries, reach their expiration date. 
With a strong focus on social issues like health and education, they were instrumental in reducing by half the number of people living in absolute poverty. But despite this historic success, the continuation of current policies would not bring us much further in the eradication of poverty. The broad and well-informed international discussion over the past years has demonstrated that a paradigm shift is urgent now. There will be no end uh, to poverty without economic wealth and growth, and there will be no decent future at all if the environment degrades. During the many discussions I have participated, particularly in the context of the United Nations and World Economic Forum, it has become obvious that governments, international organizations, civil society, and, and the private sector will have an important but distinct role. And Secretary Wenemann has underlined this uh, very well. If not, we're well, not in a position to deal with future, ch future challenges like uh, climate change, food security, water and resource scarcity. Most remarkably, the concept of creating shared values starts from a different angle, but addresses similar challenges. That is excellent news and a good omen for a paradigm shift to be successful. There is a strong hope that public policies can be consistent with what the most advanced and far-sighted entrepreneurs have identified as the future of their business. That does, of course, not mean that a new mindset is already established or can be taken for granted. The old shadows have not gone away. The anti-business activists and also neoclassical economists will still see private companies only as prompters of profit, even if they have very different ideas what to do with the profit. Nor will it be easy to walk uh, the talk. I would be now intrigued to embark on uh, conceptual thoughts, but I know also that I have not been invited for this as a scientist or um, a schooler, but I will focus on a couple of examples of experience uh, we did the last years. Since my country is a strong supporter of market economy and free enterprise, Swiss public aid programs have always been more open to cooperation with the private sector than the average OECD country. However, a positive attitude towards the private sector does not automatically result in common and successful undertakings. A government agency has its own policy objectives. In many ways, they are different from the objectives of a private company. Typically, development agencies have a strong ingredient of other foreign policy priorities. A private company rightly focuses on market opportunities. It is not charity, and if it were charity, it would not be interesting as a partner for Swiss Development Corporation. What we sought in our undertakings with the private uh, sector was primarily their distinctive knowledge about markets and very often their unparalleled technical knowledge, which is the basis also for their economic success, for the economic success of the companies. Even if money is needed to run public-private development partnerships, our main contribution was not funding either. It was and is knowledge of the markets for the poor and familiarity with poor people's living conditions. Sometimes also privileged access to, in, uh, to, to government institutions. Both partners, public and private, must find an advantage in the cooperation that goes beyond financial, reputational, 
or charity issues, and they need to be clear from the beginning. Let me give you three very specific examples. For many years, uh, we have run an interesting program in rural development with Nestle in Pakistan. It is much older than the term and concept of shared value, but for us, it was an excellent lesson learned that helped to break new ground in our operational work and in our thinking. We were interested in promoting family farming. One of the reasons was job creation opportunities, but at the same time, it allowed us to address many other issues like the role of women in society and environmental concerns. Nestle had a dairy production business and was interested in extension services, in capacity building among farmers, and that would allow them to supply milk with the required quality. The extension service was our role and our long-standing business. The program gave eventually hundreds of thousands of people a living and had an impact long after it came to an end. Recently, we worked with similar projects in the area of flagrances in Haiti, as in financial services, but much less known, Switzerland, Swiss companies are key players when it comes to flagrances and perfumes as a wholesaler, not so much with the specific brands. The second issue is about skills development. Many developing countries face a dramatic shortage of skilled labor that limits foreign investment, but also the development of the local economy. Very often, public training programs provide uh, not the right cutting edge uh, education. Private companies have the access to a much more uh, advanced kind of knowledge that is useful in technical, in technical training. So we built up, for instance, in South Africa, but also in Eastern Europe, a uh, kind of uh, technical education programs we would not have been in a position to without the public-private partnership. Microinsurance, the lack of insurance plans, and this has been mentioned uh, before, for small farmers make farming risky in many places. People abandon even agricultural territory, which has negative effects on urbanization, food security, and indeed on the natural environment. That being said, it is not possible to run insurance models as in Europe, the United States, or as for big farming enterprises. That unsolved problem was the starting point for our cooperation with a series of insurance companies, including Swissre, Allianz, and Zurich. Zurich, which is, by the way, the biggest foreign insurance company in the United States. The Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation could never have afforded the technical skills and the knowledge to develop viable business models. The insurance partner found it difficult to work on the ground in remote, underdeveloped, and sometimes dangerous areas. The benefit for both is obvious. It is about both developing markets and eradicating poverty. It was about maintaining jobs and preserving soils and natural resources. The last of my three examples show also sometimes else that is important. When I was responsible for development cooperation uh, in, in Switzerland, we focused on areas where Switzerland has comparative advantages and this is in Duralia in financial and in insurance services. I'll come now with the quotation. Every individual necessary labors to render the annual revenue of the society as great as he can. He generally neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows 
how much he is promoting it. He intends only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which has no part of his intention. This has been, as you have realized, written in 1776 by Adam Smith. He explained to his contemporaries the benefit of capitalism and its potential for the wealth of nation. Adam Smith's time and thinking have gone with the shadows. The world we are called up to understand and to shape has little in common with the days of British uh, Enlightenment. How Ed, however, Adam Smith, much more than many of his later disciples, was always aware of the ethical, philosophical, and psychological underpinning of his thinking and of its historical limitations as well. As a schooler of moral philosophy and economics, he would have loved, of course, to take part in today's discussion. Because it is, after all, as Michael Porter and Mark Kramer wrote in their famous article on creating shared value in the Harvard Business Review about resetting the boundaries of capitalism, and it is about ending poverty as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thanks to each of you. Um, and we're going to open this up to questions, but I'm going to ask one first of everybody just to, to comment, and then, then we'll turn to, to, the, to you all for, for a few questions. <clears throat> You've all mentioned some of the, the challenges of, of the private sector engaging with governments in, uh, and with international organizations in, in uh, food security and, and agricultural development. I wonder if we could follow that a little bit and say what and, and see what other challenges there might be out there to uh, the private sector engaging more in agricultural development. I think I've run into a number of companies where shared value is a shared concept here, but it's not necessarily a shared uh, concept to other companies. And uh, you know, unlike Nestle, there are a number of uh, uh, international uh, businesses that don't focus too much on, on shared value. And is that due to a philosophical issue or are there other government or international barriers to that? And then sort of the flip side of the question is what can the private sector itself do uh, to get much more engaged with government and international organizations uh, to promote shared value and agricultural growth and development? Fire away. <laughs> well, uh, I'll start. Uh, you know, uh, as H.L. Mencken who once said, for every complicated problem, there is a simple and a wrong solution. So I'm trying to figure out what is the simple <laughs> thing I can do to answer yeah. your question. Uh, you know, I've participated. I see Deb Atwood is here. I participate in a, in a, in a project <laughs> called Agree, which is basically an effort to try to collaborate between differing institutions big corporations, smallholder farmers, NGOs, Gates Foundation. It's a, a lot of it's foundation funded. And the idea was is that if you get all these parties into the room and they talk to each other, you'll be able to integrate their thinking and maybe get something done in areas that you couldn't get things done before and move governments. In some cases, you have to go around governments to get things done. Uh, and so um, I think that uh, uh, th that concept of what I call interdisciplinary collaboration between the parties that really care. So who are they? Well, they are some of the foundations that are really in this world. Uh, not, not just to pick on Gates, but Gates happens to be one that's most involved. But there are a lot of foundations and NGOs in this world. Um, there's the United States government and the British government and other governments that are actively involved in this, that are doing it for the, you know, certainly the right reason. And then there's a lot of money to be made. I talked about the fact that uh, I think it is in um, it, the African food market is expected to reach a value of $1 trillion by 2030. So that ought to inspire a lot of people to engage uh, where they can. And so um, there, there, there's no one magic answer, uh, you know, but I think that's why in different strokes for different folks, different countries are, will produce different results. Uh, they have different problems. 
And uh, so this is going to be trial and error. There's no one size fits all, but there is enormous opportunity out there. And the private sector is, is going to find this opportunity before the government's going to find the opportunity, in my judgment. I think um, I agree with Dan, as I always do. Um, but I think there has been traditionally a lot of um, distrust among the various institutions in working together. Um, I think that, you know, as, as we see today, a lot of coordination going on among NGOs, international organizations, the private sector, even governments. Um, it doesn't always translate into the field that way. In other words, the people on the ground. Because there's been a distrust, you know, people that work for civil society have always distrusted anybody that wants to make money. And people who are in business distrust the NGOs because they've traditionally paid, played kind of a name and shame game. And so I think one of the things we have to do is to build that trust, and we see that changing. Environmental groups are helping businesses now to build new uh, ways of addressing water issues or other environmental issues in the field. We particularly see it coming together with environmental organizations, but also now more and more with development organizations. I think social businesses, I mentioned them briefly in my remarks, but I think they've played a key role, uh, really looking at, you know, how do you bring sort of business-like approaches to development? And there's a number of great examples out there. Um, I think an area where you can really see governments, the private sector and civil society coming together on a policy issue is on land rights. I think this is happening in some places, but not nearly to the extent that it should. I mean, when we look at the, the issue of land rights and the fact that farmers can't get credit without land rights, Women, you can't transfer property. Women are off, often excluded from owning property. And there are NGOs that work on this issue. Governments need to be, to understand how to, to put together good land rights policies. That's certainly been a part of the MCC's approach um, and helpful in that regard. But the private sector can play a role in this too because it's to their benefit to have stability on with those who are, who are creating their, their, you know, input products. So I think, um, I think building trust, building ways in which the civil society government and the private sector can work together is, is critical as we go forward. Thank you very much. I will speak about the distrust as, um, as Secretary Wenemann did. I think this is, uh, to a certain extent, the key uh, point. For me, a major challenge is the mindset. We have about 10 years ago discussed a lot and are still discussing a lot about the corporate social responsibility concept. There is nothing wrong with uh, making companies accountable for their behavior with regard uh, to human rights, with regard to environment. But if you look at the paradigm behind it is the paradigm of a company that is not intrinsically good, that is rather intrinsically bad, and you should come with a scheme that limits to a certain extent the activities. And for me, the concept of shared values is something else. It is, and this is the reason why I refer to Adam Smith, it is showing that a company, by pursuing its own objective, creates a benefit for the society. And this is a kind of paradigm shift I think would be good to do in the discussion about public-private partnership, but it is not uh, done enough. The second point um, uh, I think uh, has, has been mentioned by uh, Secretary uh, Glickman in, in his intervention. Uh, the traditional role, to a certain extent, of the government was to create a decent environment for economic activities. I think this is still true, but we are living in a new world, and we have to reinvent it. And, uh, 
corruption uh, in some places, uh, even failed states, uh, a legal system that is not working, and so on, are enormous impediments, are hampering uh, investment, are hampering development, and eventually uh, lead us in a situation where people remained in poverty. So this is for me a priority. And if you go back to the Millennium Development Goals, in all those areas where you have conflict, crises, and, uh, and fragility, no, none of those uh, eight objectives have been uh, achieved. Could, could I just offer one other thing? This is a little bit parochial, and, and everybody is, is instrumental and important, but the significance and importance of the role of the United States government to provide leadership is really critical. And the classic example is PEPFAR and AIDS, where President Bush created an environment, and others, other countries were involved, but created an environment where this was important, that we were going to alleviate AIDS and malaria and TB, and granted, the medical issues are a lot more easy to refine and define than a lot of the food security and agriculture areas, but, but um, and other countries are in great leadership roles, Swiss, the British, and, and the Brazilians, and, and others, but, so, so I want to just kind of reinforce my hope that what follows on Raj Shah's departure and what follows on the departure of this administration, as Ambassador Garvelink knows, because he was very much a part of it, it can be inspirational and catalytic to get the pri private sector engaged, because it has been. Okay, let's open it up, and we'll take uh, two or three questions, and then uh, we'll see what, what time we have left. Two questions, all right. In the back. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rosemary Segero. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. We are a civil society organization based here in Washington, D.C., and uh, I come from Kenya. And thank you so much for your presentation. Looking at and most of the organization, big guys organization, which is the private sector, public sector, don't there is that mistrust within the big guys here to giving donations and the other recipients who don't want to work with small organizations in the rural areas who do more work with farmers and small businesses. So that coordination and cooperation is not there. There's so much money that has gone in agriculture to big organizations in Kenya and all the offices are based in Kenya. I know them. I don't want to name them here. But they don't get to the rural area people where we have 75%. How do these people get help working with us? They don't want to hear that. So if they don't want to hear that, how do we fight poverty? If we don't know where, who gave them the money, we know who gave them the money, how many millions they have, and we still talk about poverty. So this is very, very bad, and as Anne said, mistrust. They don't want to give the money. They don't want we work like civil, we work like uh, volunteers for them, giving them information. They come for more money, for money donation, and there is nothing that is happening on the ground. So, how do we deal with this situation in Africa as a whole? Even though I'm in Kenya, how do we deal with this, and how do we work with you as civil society who want to make and fight poverty in Africa? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, why don't we uh, take a couple more? Why don't we bunch a couple? Jim. Uh, Bob Thompson, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, one point I didn't think came out strongly enough in creating shared value is the important role the private sector has to play in creating the jobs that are going to be necessary for to ultimately to solve the problem of rural poverty. Uh, no country in the world has ever solved the problem of rural poverty in agriculture alone. Developing agriculture is essential, uh, raising productivity, uh, but uh, Every country that's uh, made significant progress in reducing rural poverty has uh, created non-farm employment opportunities uh, within commuting distance so that the majority of the smallholders end up earning the majority of their income from non-farm sources. Uh, and uh, I don't think we can expect it to be any different in low-income countries. No government can create all the jobs that are gonna, it's going to take to do that. Government has to create the enabling environment or the investment climate, but the private, only the private sector can create the jobs that are going to be necessary. Right. Yes, in the back. 
Thank you, Lisa Moon with the Chicago Council. Um, Several of you talked about just the opportunities or the very um, exciting things that are happening with um, private sector investment right now. I know, Secretary Veneman, you mentioned just a lot of these social enterprises that are popping up, and um, Secretary Glickman, you also mentioned just the, the, the challenges with financing. Could you just speak, if, if possible, a little bit about what opportunities we might have related to accelerators? I know GAIN, for example, has launched in three countries in Africa kind of these marketplace accelerators to try to increase production of nutritious foods. and um, and help growers and processors and, and retailers who are focusing on fruits and vegetables and other things like lentils and that type of thing um, to help them get the technology they need to be growing it most efficiently, the transportation equipment. Um, I, I know that those types of things are proliferating across the U.S., but is there um, an opportunity for us to do more of that in countries um, in Africa and Asia, and, and how might we do that? Thank you. Well, uh, what now? Let's. I will turn to you guys to answer any or all of them uh, of the three questions. Ambassador. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. I um, would like to uh, to give an answer to the question that has been asked first by uh, the, the woman from Kenya. I mean, she. You are concerned about uh, aid not reaching the poorest people and by this not really re reducing uh, poverty. And of course, this is a major concern that we have seen in many places that uh, aid money does not, as planned, change the living conditions of the poor. But the cooperation in between government institutions and the private sectors is very well suited just to address this. Uh, we have uh, seen in uh, areas of uh, fragility and conflict, very often private business activities are the only activities uh, that are there. And I mentioned you before that uh, in those areas, uh, the poverty is the biggest problem, much bigger than in any other place. And the second uh, issue, I would also refer you to the setting we had uh, in our project with Nestle regarding smallholders. It was exactly not about building a big farm, but it was about including small and poor people in a value chain. And this could only be done in a setting of public-private partnership, even so the terminology was different at that time when we ran this project in Pakistan. Thanks. Um, I'd like to address that question as well. And also, let me just first comment, though, on uh, Bob's comment, because I think that's absolutely essential. How do you create jobs in rural communities that supplement farm income? And I think a lot of the food companies actually do that. When they build a processing plant and they integrate that into the community, they may, along with that, build, you know, provide clean water or even education to the community or some health care. All of that has a ripple effect. And so I think the food sector, it's not just about the extension to small farmers, it's also about the plants that are built and how those can then you know, create uh, economic opportunity for whole communities that may not have had it otherwise. Um, I wanna go back to this question of, 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 from the woman from Kenya because um, one of the things I saw that I w when I was at UNICEF is that you're absolutely right. Oftentimes, because agencies like the UN or development agencies have so many rules and regulations to grant money to other organizations, which is primarily the way they do it, the smaller organizations don't have the capacity to comply with the requirements and to make the applications. And so often those smallest, most, you know, interlinked with the community organizations don't have access to the resources that are actually given by development agencies and UN organizations. And I, I, I used to try to figure out, was, was there a way we could have a, a bit of a fund that our country directors could have a little more leeway with so that they could actually 
you know, provide some of these smaller organizations that couldn't do this. I'm sure you saw that as ambassador as well. But it is an issue, and it may be an opportunity for the private sector, when they're going into the smallest communities to work with farmers, to look for these indigenous organizations and say, how could we just give them a little bit to, to, to interface and do some of the education that we need to do? Um, and then, I, you know, I, Lisa, I'm not really sure how to answer your question on accelerators, but I think more and more we're seeing <clears throat> new kinds of investment based upon, you know, what kind of results are people getting, not just on, you know, the bottom line, but real shared value approaches. And that's why, as I brought up the idea of shared value, which is, and the like concepts in many companies, I think another real driving force has been the way social businesses uh, have come in to, to really drive this shared value approach from the standpoint of how their business model is developed. I just uh, I can't add too much to what's been said before. A couple things. I, I still believe the data collection on best practices is not as good as it, it, it ought to be. I mean, there needs to be a way to transfer information. It's pretty easy to do these days because technology is there. So we can figure out what is being done in one country, what is working, what isn't working, what inputs were needed, what financial tools were used, and um, uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel everywhere. The second thing I would just mention is leadership and all these things. So uh, some of you may know Kali Bamba. He's uh, an Ethiopian. He runs the Ethiopian Agriculture Transformation Agency. He was a former Gates Foundation employee. He's very, very brilliant young leader. And he has helped facilitate the development in Ethiopia of these extension networks all over the country that do two things. They're agriculture extension and they're health extension, and they're combined. And his goal in this is to promote leadership, to get people into these centers and then help them kind of inspire them to be what they can become, so to speak. And, and so one of the things, whether it's in what Lisa said or even in job creation is, there's a, just an enormous amount of talent, particularly in Africa, entrepreneurial talent, people who want to achieve. How, how do you develop that talent so that they feel the spirit moving them to kind of do the things that we're talking about today? That, that's, that's a real challenge. I spent some time at the Aspen Institute, and the Aspen Institute, its foundation historically has been in leadership development and training, not just in agriculture, but leadership in government, leadership in private sector, leadership in in ethics and morals and that kind of stuff. And so that has to enter this picture If, as you look at uh, how you're going to develop a, a job-promoting environment or an atmosphere to do the kind of thing Bob Thompson just talked about. Well, I know we're, uh, the, we've run out of time, and there are other panels to come this afternoon uh, and the rest of this morning. So please uh, thank each of you for being here and for your thoughtful comments. Please join me in, in thanking the panel.